Neofumi Iwatani is an average college otaku, sharing a home and his parents' financial support with his less than ambitious younger brother. One fateful day, he finds himself in a library, engrossed in a mysterious book titled The Four Heroes Weapons Manual. Before he knows it, he's whisked away to a different world along with three other individuals. Upon arrival, Neofumi notices a shield affixed to his arm and soon realizes that he and the other three are expected to save this unfamiliar realm. While he's still grappling with the bewildering turn of events, the other three, Monoyasu with a spear, Ren with a sword, and Itsuki with a bow, seem oddly comfortable, already negotiating compensation with those who summon them. The summoners escort the four heroes to meet their ruler, King Altkray Melramark 32. While giving special attention to Monoyasu, Ren, and Itsuki, the king largely overlooks Neofumi. He outlines the dire situation. Their world is plagued by waves of calamity, interdimensional portals that sporadically unleash monsters. The four have been chosen by the legendary weapons to defend against these waves. In return for their heroism, the king promises two options. They can either be sent back to their own worlds under extraordinarily favorable circumstances or choose to remain in this new world as celebrated heroes for life. However, their current capabilities aren't sufficient to tackle the impending threats. To that end, the king assures them that volunteers will be arranged by morning to aid them in monster hunting to boost their powers. That night, as they settle into their designated quarters, the four heroes begin to learn more about each other and their strange new environment. They discover the concept of status magic, a system providing details about their capabilities and their weapons abilities. They also realize a startling fact, although they're all from Japan, it's not the same Japan for each of them. The other three heroes, having played different video games that bear uncanny similarities to their current situation, share insights about the world they now inhabit. They mention that in their respective games, Neofumi's shield hero class is deemed the loser's class. While resistant to damage from low-level monsters, Neofumi lacks significant offensive power, a disadvantage that won't improve with leveling up. The following morning, Neofumi faces further setbacks. Despite a dozen adventurers volunteering to join the heroes, not a single one picks him. Word has spread about his perceived incompetence and lack of knowledge, making him an undesirable leader. Only mine, originally from Madoyasu's team, volunteers to join him. Each hero is given a monthly allowance by the king, 800 silver coins for Neofumi, who has no team, and 600 for the others. Mine leads Neofumi to a blacksmith named Erhard, where he acquires a modest chainmail coat for 100 silver coins. To his dismay, he learns that he can't even wield a sword. Any weapon he tries to pick up flies out of his hand due to his shield's power. On his first training day, Neofumi fights orange balloons, fast, airborne monsters. His combat limitations become painfully evident as it takes him five long minutes just to defeat one while Ren easily dispatches several with his sword. However, he learns that his shield can consume monster remains to unlock different forms. Mine spends heavily on a set of armor and a sword, promising to earn it back. After dinner, she suggests sharing wine, but Neofumi declines, opting for an early night. Before retiring, he stashes some coins in his shield as a precaution. The next day, he discovers that his belongings have been stolen. Before he can investigate, royal guards seize him and drag him before the king and the other heroes. There, he's accused of attempting to rape Mine, who has since sought refuge with Madoyasu. Adding insult to injury, Madoyasu is wearing Neofumi's stolen chainmail. The king declares the alleged offense punishable by death, and no one is willing to hear Neofumi's side of the story. As Mine makes mocking faces at him, Neofumi's fury reaches its peak. He realizes he's been framed. Everything but his shield and underclothes have been stolen by Mine. When he demands evidence for the accusations, a knight produces a torn negligee, claiming it was found in his room. Neofumi rebuts that it wasn't there when he woke up. Frustrated and feeling trapped, he demands to be sent back to his world. However, the king informs him that's not an option. Heroes can only be returned after the waves of calamity are halted, and new heroes can't be summoned unless the current set is dead or the waves are stopped. The king coldly informs Neofumi that news of his alleged crime has already swept the nation, effectively quashing any hope of receiving assistance or goodwill. Stripped of his dignity, honor, and finances, Neofumi breaks free from the guards and storms out of the castle. Before leaving, he hurls the remaining coins he'd stashed in his shield at Madoyasu, realizing that from the start, everyone had been against him. In his aimless wandering, Neofumi encounters Erhard, the blacksmith who'd previously equipped him. Erhard raises a fist as if to strike, but after locking eyes with Neofumi, he changes his mind. 
Instead, he offers Neofumi some clearance armor and tells him to pay it back when possible. Enraged and with nowhere else to turn, Neofumi heads to the fields to take his fury out on the orange balloons. Working through the night, he eventually reaches level 2. The next day, Neofumi collects the remnants of the balloons he's slain and goes to a merchant to sell them. When the merchant tries to shortchange him, Neofumi counters by revealing several balloons hidden under his coat. As the creatures turn their aggression on the startled merchant, Neofumi secures a fairer deal. It becomes his method of operation, bullying his way into reasonable transactions while also fending off would-be thieves. However, Neofumi soon realizes he has lost his sense of taste since the day of the false accusations. After two weeks and two more level-ups, he finds himself in a frustrating cycle. His lack of attack power prevents him from defeating stronger monsters, hindering his leveling up, which in turn keeps him weak. Just when he's warding off another group of opportunistic party members, a peculiar little man appears, offering a radical solution to Neofumi's predicament. Instead of unreliable allies, what he really needs is someone magically bound to obey him, a slave, unable to betray, lie, or disobey due to a life-threatening curse. The odd man turns out to be a slave trader, operating from a sprawling tent filled with caged beings that aren't quite human. As Neofumi browses the selection, guided by the trader's suggestions, he notices a small raccoon-like demi-human, who seems to be afflicted with a cough. Olaukas, the slave trader, ushers Neofumi into a tent filled with demi-humans, creatures with physical animal characteristics. While human slavery is forbidden in Melramark, owing to its human supremacist government, the trade in demi-humans is permitted. Olaukas initially offers Neofumi a high-level werewolf-type beastman, but it's immediately clear the price is beyond Neofumi's means. Commending Neofumi's eye for value, the trader then shows him more affordable options. Neofumi chooses Raftalia, a sickly tanuki-type demi-human girl he'd noticed earlier. Next, Neofumi takes Raftalia to Urhard. Despite his disapproval, ominously warning Neofumi, you're not gonna die a painless death, Urhard outfits Raftalia with a chainmail dress and a knife. In the field, Neofumi has her stab one of the balloons, introducing her to combat and gaining insight into the party system. Specifically, he learns that party members share experience points, and realizes that Mine had never formed a party with him. After the field training, Neofumi and Raftalia dine at a restaurant. Later, while grinding medicinal leaves in the forest, he gives Raftalia medicine to cure her illness. She learns of his identity as the shield hero and recalls her father speaking about the hero's legendary kindness toward demi-humans. The next day, Neofumi finds out from the medicinal shop owner that medicines are in high demand due to the impact of the waves on various towns. He shifts his focus to gathering and selling medicinal products. As the days pass, Neofumi and Raftalia grow closer. He buys her a ball for her leisure time, treats her to snacks, gives her a haircut, and comforts her when nightmares plague her. Neofumi explains the purpose behind their hunting, to gain the strength needed to combat the waves of calamity. He admits his own limitations, having next to zero attack power, and clarifies that Raftalia will have to do the fighting. However, he promises to act as her steadfast guardian in return. Recognizing Raftalia's progress, Urhard upgrades her weapon from a knife to a short sword. Neofumi and Raftalia travel to Ryut village to trade and hear of an opportunity from a local merchant. The village's coal mine, rich in valuable minerals, is overrun by monsters lingering from the first wave. Neither the kingdom's knights nor the other heroes have cleared it out. Before venturing into the mine, Neofumi unlocks new abilities for his shield, including the rope shield, which allows him to lasso, and the air strike shield, a summonable barrier. Inside the mine, he also unlocks the pickaxe shield, enabling him to chip through bedrock more easily. The pair manage to acquire some ore, but encounter a two-headed black dog, a monster from the first wave that triggers traumatic memories for Raftalia, reminding her of the beast that killed her parents. In a desperate situation, Neofumi realizes they can't outrun the beast and decides to confront it. As he holds off the dog, Raftalia is initially paralyzed by her past trauma. Neofumi tells her to flee while he holds the monster. Faced with the terrifying replay of her parents' death, Raftalia also fears losing Neofumi. Overwhelmed by a mix of courage and despair, she grabs her knife and kills the monster, running to an injured Neofumi for comfort, marking the real beginning of their relationship. After the ordeal, they dine at a restaurant where Raftalia collects a flag from her kid's meal. Neofumi adds a red dot to the white flag, turning it into a miniature Japanese flag. 
a reminder of what he's fighting for, to escape this biased world and return home. Two weeks into their monster hunting adventures, Neofumi and Raftalia have made significant progress. Neofumi has unlocked an array of new shields by feeding his weapon the remnants of defeated monsters. Raftalia, on the other hand, has undergone a surprising transformation, maturing into a young woman. After an encounter with a porcupine-type monster leaves Neofumi injured, the pair visit Erhard for an armor upgrade. Erhard notices Raftalia's growth, but Neofumi remains oblivious, assuming that any comments about her appearance are coming from people with taste in lolicons. This frustrates Raftalia. Foregoing the available armor options, they opt for a custom commission. Returning to the shop after dinner, Neofumi continues to treat Raftalia like a child, adding to her annoyance. Equipped with their new barbarian armor, Neofumi ruminates on the unpredictable timing and location of the next wave. Her heart enlightens him about the red hourglass of the dragon's era, a timer that counts down to the next wave and transports the heroes to its location. Armed with this crucial information that Neofumi feels he should have had from the start, they head to the tower to register. At the tower, they encounter the other heroes, Matoyasu, Ren, and Itsuki and their respective parties. Matoyasu shamelessly flirts with Raftalia while throwing veiled insults at Neofumi. Fuming, Neofumi leaves with Raftalia, choosing to focus on preparing for the next wave. Just before the impending wave, Raftalia takes a moment to express her deep gratitude and loyalty to Neofumi. She makes vows to always follow him, cementing their bond. Once the final grain of sand falls in the dragon hourglass, Neofumi and Raftalia find themselves just outside Ryut village. Realizing the villagers haven't evacuated and the knights won't arrive in time, Neofumi faces a gut-wrenching truth. The village is doomed unless they intervene. Rejecting the conventional hero role of boss hunting, they opt for frontline defense against a tide of undead and monster bees. They execute a tactical split. Raftalia assists in the evacuation, while Neofumi lures as many monsters as he can away from the village. Pulling off a daring move, Neofumi topples a flaming guard tower onto the advancing horde. Emboldened by his valor, Raftalia and several villagers rejoin him, ready to stand their ground. Just when you think backup arrives in the form of Melramark's knights, they shockingly resort to firebombing with utter disregard for civilian or hero safety. A fuming Raftalia almost goes blade to neck with the captain but is halted by his vice captain. Neofumi urges them to redirect their firepower toward the actual threat. The higher ranking knights disdainfully leave to aid the other heroes, yet the vice captain and a few lower ranking ones opt to stay, forming an uneasy alliance with Neofumi. Eventually, the other heroes triumph over the wave's boss, a fearsome chimera, cutting off the monster influx and effectively ending the crisis. While these heroes gear up for a pat on the back and a bag of rewards, the villagers pour heartfelt gratitude onto Neofumi. Some losses were inevitable, but they had minimized the carnage. Raftalia, haunted by her own past as an orphan of the first wave, questions if they've at least spared some children that cruel fate. Neofumi confirms they have, patting her head as she breaks down, shedding tears for both present victories and past sorrows. In the aftermath of the second wave, the kingdom of Melramark is in a festive mood. A grand celebration unfolds at the royal castle, where the king himself offers his congratulations to the bow, sword, and spear heroes. Neofumi, the shield hero, sits alone, mulling over his forced attendance for the sake of his due reward. In this sea of indifference, Neofumi delves into his help menu, discovering a teleportation feature that could be a game-changer for future waves. As he explores the menu, he spots the knight captain embellishing his own heroics to a rapt audience of young noblewomen. In truth, the captain had abandoned Neofumi and barely contributed to the wave's defeat. Nearby, nobles buzz with praise for the heroes, particularly impressed by the limited casualties. Matoyasu, the spear hero, finds himself the center of female attention until mine. Green with envy, interrupts the conversations. When Matoyasu spots Raftalia navigating through the crowd, Mine stealthily leans in to whisper something into his ear. Raftalia, for her part, urges a disinterested Neofumi to eat. He declines, fixated on preparing for the next wave and unable to taste the food anyway. Not to be deterred, Raftalia persuades him to sample some cake. This innocent act stirs a storm. In a flare of drama, Matoyasu removes a glove and flings it at Neofumi's feet, challenging him to a duel. The room freezes, a collective intake of breath hanging in the air. Neofumi, however, remains composed. Matoyasu confronts Neofumi about Raftalia's status as a slave, demanding her freedom if he wins the duel. Neofumi points out that slavery is legal, but Matoyasu insists it's ethically wrong. 
Ren and Itsuki. The other heroes also express their disapproval, visibly disgusted by Neofumi's actions. When Neofumi inquires about his own reward for winning, Matoyasu hesitates before suggesting that he could keep her. Unimpressed by the lack of stakes, Neofumi tries to leave, but is stopped by guards and a disapproving King Alkari, who forces him to accept the duel. As Raftalia tries to vouch for her voluntary alliance with Neofumi, she's abruptly gagged and dragged away, the king dismissing her as being influenced by the slave crest. Infuriated and cornered, Neofumi grudgingly agrees to duel but demands Raftalia's return upon victory. Mayan takes this moment to mock Neofumi, pointing out his inability to attack and eliciting laughter from the biased crowd. In the courtyard, the duel commences. Despite a 22-level disadvantage and the crowd squarely in Matoyasu's corner, Neofumi stands his ground. Using his light metal shield, he easily deflects Matoyasu's attacks. Neofumi boldly claims victory when Matoyasu fails to penetrate his shield. Matoyasu then attempts a powerful Chaos Spear attack, but it barely phases Neofumi. Caught in the cooldown period, Matoyasu becomes vulnerable. Seizing this window of opportunity, Neofumi strikes back. Using an arsenal of balloon monsters and a variety of shields, Neofumi turns the tables, cornering Matoyasu. Outraged, the spear hero accuses him of fighting unfairly, only to find himself ensnared by Neofumi's dog demon shield. Neofumi traps him within a shield prison filled with balloon monsters, stunning the crowd and nobles alike. The courtyard grows tense as everyone realizes Matoyasu could actually lose. Just as Neofumi is about to seal his victory, Mine intervenes with a blast of wind magic. Matoyasu, his cooldown period over, retaliates with a devastating lightning spear attack. Drained and triumphant, Matoyasu claims victory. When Neofumi protests the blatant cheating, the crowd remains silent, dismissing him as a sore loser. King Altkray and Mine further malign Neofumi, declaring Matoyasu the winner. As Mine revels in Neofumi's defeat, King Altkray congratulates Matoyasu for his accomplishment, revealing that Mine is actually Princess Malti. Mine rushes to join her father, King Altkray, proclaiming her goal to save the world. As she does, the spear hero Matoyasu receives healing, leaving Neofumi alone in the arena to stew over the revelation. It hits him like a ton of bricks, he was set up for failure right from the start. Malti never wanted to be his companion. Her joining him was an elaborate act to bring him down. Exploiting his naive trust, she not only secured armor but also assessed his knowledge and financial standing. Once she had what she needed, she robbed him blind, all but ensuring his doom. Her accusations serve dual purposes. They won her the sympathy of her chosen hero, Matoyasu, while also blacklisting Neofumi among the citizens. The goal was to make it impossible for him to recover from his losses, both material and reputational. Meanwhile, King Altkray wasn't the righteous leader Neofumi had initially thought him to be. As Malti's father, it was almost certain that he was in on the plot. Even if he wasn't, he did nothing to help Neofumi, letting him suffer a wrongful fate. It became painfully clear that the king, for reasons yet unknown, harbored an intense hate for the shield hero. He had no intention of conducting a fair investigation into the charges against Neofumi. This orchestrated bias against him clarified why the people of Melramark so easily believed Malti's lie. With King Altkray's endorsement, her false narrative went unchallenged, turning public opinion against Neofumi, even among those who might have been inclined to believe his side of the story. The duel with Matoyasu wasn't a fight for honor, it was another trap set by the royal family. Mine simply played on Matoyasu's ego, probably feeding him a tale of Neofumi's supposed mistreatment of Raftalia. It wasn't about saving her, it was about further isolating Neofumi by taking away his only ally. As Neofumi stands there, a dark mist begins to emanate from his shield, mirroring his growing despair and anger. He didn't ask for any of this, not to be summoned to this world, not to be a hero, and certainly not to be the despised shield hero. Yet, here he is, the target of relentless, unwarranted hate. Adding insult to injury, a minister announces Matoyasu's heroic act of freeing Raftalia. The crowd turns uglier, labeling Neofumi as scum and even calling for his execution. It's the last straw. Neofumi snaps, consumed by a seething rage that physically manifests as a dark mist enveloping him. As he succumbs to this anger, his vision blurs. He hallucinates Raftalia in her childlike form, having her slave crest removed. His warped perception makes him see her walk away with mine, reinforcing his sense of abandonment. 
an attempt to discard his cursed shield fails, it reattaches itself as if mocking his helplessness. In that dark moment, Neofumi decides he's had enough. If the world is against him, then he's against the world. His overflowing emotions unlock something ominous within his shield, the curse series. Lost in his spiraling negativity and newly activated power, he becomes blind to everything around him. Neofumi, consumed by his own dark emotions and the ominous power of his shield, doesn't realize the turn of events. Monoyasu gets a resounding slap from Raftalia, not a hug of gratitude as he'd expected. The king, Malti, and the spectators are dumbfounded. Raftalia publicly calls Monoyasu a cheat, cutting through the facade. Malti, incredulous, demands an explanation. Raftalia ignores her and zeroes in on Monoyasu. She never asked to be rescued. A heated exchange unfolds. While Monoyasu stumbles through his rationale, Raftalia parries every argument with unassailable truths. Monoyasu's next claim, that Raftalia had to be freed because she was a slave, and therefore must have been abused, reveals his ignorance. He took Malti's words at face value, never bothering to investigate or even ask Raftalia. She exposes this flaw, stating Matoyasu knows nothing about the real Neofumi. Raftalia counters Matoyasu's argument, emphasizing that Neofumi never mistreated her. While the shield hero may have activated the curse to prompt her to fight, he never coerced her beyond her will. Matoyasu's retort, that no one should be forced to fight, comes off as hollow. It's he and the king who have forced Neofumi into a one-sided duel, after all. Matoyasu, summoned to this world to combat deadly waves, is essentially here to fight, willing or not. Raftalia goes further, laying out the practical necessities of their situation. Because of the shield's limitations, Neofumi can't wield other weapons. If he's to have a shot at surviving the waves and the host of challenges this world throws at him, he needs allies who can fight. Matoyasu clings to his notion that Raftalia shouldn't be the one to help Neofumi, portraying the shield hero as a vile man who will eventually discard her. But here too, he's treading on thin ice. His accusations are based solely on Malti's lies, revealing how little he knows about the real Neofumi or the true nature of Raftalia's relationship with him. What's more, it's partly because of Matoyasu's own actions that Neofumi can't find allies in the first place. Raftalia seizes the moment to call Matoyasu out once more, spotlighting his ignorance. Walking eyes with Matoyasu, Raftalia lays bare the truth. From the moment Neofumi bought her, he treated her not as a slave but as an equal. In a world where demi-humans are looked down upon, Neofumi was the exception. He cared for Raftalia when she was on death's door, providing food, clothing, and even medicine all while having scarce resources himself. Matoyasu is visibly rattled by this revelation, clinging to his preconceived notions that Neofumi couldn't possibly be this kind-hearted. But those notions are founded on Melty's rumor. Raftalia pushes her point home, presenting a list of the ways Neofumi had supported her. He fed her, clothed her, and made medicine for her illness, things no one else in Melramark bothered to do. Matoyasu tries to defend himself, saying he too could be as kind. But Raftalia is quick to call his bluff. If he's so kind, she asks, why hasn't he used his superior resources to help a demi-human, enslaved or otherwise? Her question leaves Matoyasu speechless. His high moral ground about the evils of slavery comes crashing down. He's done nothing to improve the plight of anyone like Raftalia despite his resources and royal connections. With that, Raftalia demolishes Matoyasu's moral grandstanding. Despite his self-image as a savior and his close ties to the royal family, he hasn't lifted a finger to help anyone like Raftalia. It's Neofumi, the outcast and vilified shield hero, who has actually made a difference in the life of a suffering demi-human. In front of Melramark's elite, Raftalia, a demi-human considered the lowest in society, had just publicly humiliated the country's poster hero, Matoyasu, while protecting the so-called villainous shield hero. Matoyasu tries to counter, but Princess Malti cuts him off. Infuriated that her plot is unraveling and her golden boy Matoyasu is being shamed, she orders Raftalia to be silent. Malti's blatant disregard for the demi-human only confirms what Neofumi had suspected. She never cared for Raftalia. Malti raises her hand, ready to strike Raftalia. Just then, a man in the crowd spots something. Ren and Itsuki enter the arena. The crowd mutters in confusion. Itsuki, visibly annoyed, demands an explanation for Malti's illegal interference in the duel. Malti plays dumb, leaving Matoyasu puzzled. Ren, standing behind a stunned Raftalia, bluntly tells Matoyasu that he lost the duel. Dropping a bombshell, Ren corroborates Neofumi's claims. Matoyasu didn't win fairly. Someone had used wind magic on Neofumi, giving Matoyasu an unfair advantage. Though he doesn't name names, Ren's glare at Malti says it all. 
Marayasu turns to his girlfriend, a look of dawning realization on his face. Malti puts on an innocent smile, attempting to brush off the allegations. She argues that if what the bow and sword heroes were saying were true, someone would have spoken up already. Itsuki swiftly counters her point, attributing the crowd's silence to King Altkray's veiled threat, made at the end of the rig duel. The king's proclamation wasn't just declaring a false victory, it was a warning to his subjects to keep quiet or face consequences. Their uneasy and anxious expressions say it all, they know the truth but dare not speak it. Ren directs a disgusted look at both Malti and her father, disappointed that they'd stoop so low as to corrupt a sacred duel with their royal authority. King Altkray, caught in the lie, avoids eye contact with the heroes. Malti goes silent, her scheme is ruined. Wadoyasu looks at his companion, his previous sense of triumph over Neofumi completely evaporated. In the stands, a ripple of anxious whispers sweeps through the crowd, who are now clearly unnerved by the surprising intervention of the bow and sword heroes. The high priest and his officials seem notably unsettled by this turn of events, their expressions marked with particular concern. Raftalia, having made her point, briskly walks past Madoyasu and his allies, offering neither thanks nor even a glance. She ignores Ren, Itsuki, Malti, Madoyasu, and the king, showing no deference to their stations in society. Her focus is solely on Neofumi, the shield hero. A heavy silence blankets the area as Raftalia approaches Neofumi, who's lost in his own world of despair and anger. Oblivious to her earlier defense, he bristles when she cautiously tries to engage him. Consumed by his sense of betrayal, he lashes out, branding her a traitor and scornfully asking if she's come to gloat. He then dismisses her, telling her to go away. Treading carefully, Raftalia confesses that she's heard the circulating rumors about him. However, this only deepens Neofumi's fury. When she attempts to say she doesn't believe the rumors, that she trusts him, he cuts her off, refusing to listen or let her finish. Frustrated and anguished, Neofumi screams that he's innocent, but inside, he knows that his words likely fall on deaf ears. When Raftalia steps closer, he pushes her away, questioning her motives and even doubting her loyalty. Blinded by his own pain and mistrust, he doesn't realize that Raftalia is trying to offer him comfort. Instead, he thinks it's another trick to torment him. He questions aloud what else the people of Melramark plan to take from him. In a futile act of desperation, Neofumi attempts to rip the shield off his arm, but Raftalia stops him. She places her hand on the shield, reminding him that this very shield saved her life, and he, despite all his limitations, had protected others during the waves. Neofumi tries to dismiss her words, confessing that he initially saw her only as a tool. But Raftalia ignores this, stating bluntly that he saved her. She reaches out, embracing him firmly. In a definitive stand, Raftalia declares her unwavering loyalty to Neofumi. She proclaims that she knows he's kind and asserts her intention to stay by his side no matter the rumors or accusations. As she releases him from her hug, something transformative happens. Neofumi's skewed perception of her fades, revealing Raftalia as an adult. Simultaneously, the debilitating power of his cursed shield starts to recede. Raftalia then says the one thing Neofumi has been desperate to hear, she believes in his innocence. The emotional weight of her words strikes him deeply, and he suddenly realizes how much he had underestimated her steadfast loyalty. Finally, as if released from a spell, the curse series power dissipates, clearing the fog that had enveloped Neofumi's judgment and senses. Confused by Raftalia's adult appearance, Neofumi questions who she is. She reassures him that she's the same Raftalia who has been by his side all along and vows to continue supporting supporting him, even if she feels like a burden. Overwhelmed by emotion, Neofumi finally breaks down. For the first time since he was summoned to this hostile world, he feels like he has a true ally in Raftalia. The relentless weeks of scorn, rumors, and accusations seem to lighten as Raftalia holds him in a comforting embrace, affirming her belief in his innocence. The focus shifts back to the masterminds of the whole thing, King Altkray and Princess Malti. The king's cold glare and the princess's look of disbelief reveal that Raftalia's heartfelt declaration hasn't swayed them. Wordlessly, the king turns his back on the pair, silently admitting that their scheme to separate Neofumi from his loyal companion has failed. The evidence is there for all to see. Hundreds of witnesses saw the removal of Raftalia's slave crest and heard her sincere affirmations. There's no room for doubt anymore. Raftalia stands by Neofumi not because she's forced but because she chooses to, sealing the fact in the minds of everyone present that she is genuinely loyal to the shield hero. Knowing he's been defeated, King Altkray exits the arena. 
Princess Malty follows. Their supporters in the stands catch the unspoken signal. The show is over and they too begin to leave. In the middle of the arena, Maroyasu stands dejected, gripping his spear as if it could buoy his shattered self-image. In spite of all the evidence and heartfelt declarations, he clings to his belief that he's in the right, convinced that Neofumi is the villain for having a slave. He can't wrap his head around the idea that someone like Raftalia would willingly follow a man he finds so repugnant, insisting she must be brainwashed. Ren and Itsuki, unwilling to let this slide, pointedly counter that it's obvious to anyone watching Neofumi and Raftalia that their bond is genuine. Neofumi remains oblivious to Maroyasu's inner turmoil, lost in the embrace of Raftalia. Eventually, overwhelmed by the day's events, he falls asleep on her lap. Come morning, Neofumi wakes up to find the woman he's always seen as a child has indeed grown up. Raftalia explains the unique biology of demi-humans and how they age rapidly in relation to their levels, a trait that further fuels the discrimination against them in Melremark. Raftalia then presents Neofumi with sandwiches made from last night's feast leftovers. As he takes a bite, a look of amazement crosses his face. For the first time, he can actually taste the food. Raftalia reassures him once more that they're on this journey together every step of the way. In a luxurious room elsewhere, a mysterious woman listens intently as a spy briefs her on the latest developments concerning Neofumi and the royal family. Intrigued but not overly surprised by the king's actions, she suspects Princess Malti is behind most of it. Pleased to hear that Neofumi has found an ally in Raftalia, she shifts her focus to more pressing concerns, maintaining stability in her own region and keeping an eye on Melremark's neighboring countries. The woman instructs her spy to continue his surveillance in the capital anticipating more turbulence due to Melremark's controversial summoning of the heroes. Back in the royal court, the heroes gather to receive their respective rewards for their service against the waves and for fulfilling the requests of the crown. Each is allocated silver as per the initial promise. Maroyasu receives 4,000, Itsuki and Ren each get 3,800, and Neofumi is set to receive 500. However, the king abruptly announces that Neofumi's reward is forfeited to cover the costs of freeing Raftalia from her slave contract. This blatant injustice does not go unnoticed by Itsuki and Ren, who protest the unfair treatment. They argue that Neofumi was never defeated in the duel, pointing out the king's own violations including the interference from Princess Malti. Malti attempts to defend her father by suggesting that Neofumi broke the rules by bringing balloons into the duel. But Itsuki and Ren are quick to counter. They point out that her argument has no standing given her own violation of the rules by casting a spell to sabotage Neofumi. Moreover, Ren adds that Neofumi's actions during the wave were commendable and instrumental in minimizing casualties. As such, he certainly deserves proper compensation. Despite Itsuki and Ren's impassioned defense, the king remains obstinate, though the resistance leads him to grudgingly grant Neofumi the original 500 silvers he had promised him. After receiving his meager payment, the king dismisses Neofumi from the castle. Before Neofumi can respond, Raftalia steps in. With a disdainful look at the king and the princess, she signals that it's time for them to go, leaving the royals visibly annoyed. Satisfied, Neofumi takes Raftalia's cue and the two leave together. They head back to Balaukas, where Raftalia requests the restoration of her slave crest. To her, it's a symbol of the trust she shares with Neofumi. Although she hopes this act will make him recognize her as a woman, the point sails over Neofumi's head. As he absorbs the ritual ink into his legendary shield, he unlocks a slave series feature, boosting Raftalia's stats with each level up. Declining Balauka's offer to repurchase Raftalia, Neofumi spots a monster egg raffle. For 100 silvers, he could win a random monster egg. At the very least, he'd end up with a Philoleal, a creature suitable for travel. But there's also a dragon egg in the mix, worth a considerable 20 gold pieces if raised correctly. Seizing the opportunity, Neofumi listens as Balaukas outlines a special package deal for both the new slave crest and the egg raffle. Neofumi then stops by the medicinal shop. Grateful for Neofumi's role in safeguarding his family during the recent wave, the owner gifts him an intermediate book on potion crafting. A similar act of gratitude awaits him at the magic shop. The owner reveals that Neofumi has an affinity for healing and support magic, while Raftalia leans toward dark and light magic. She also nudges Raftalia toward learning illusion magic. Although she'd love to give Neofumi an invaluable crystal ball to unlock sealed magic, she can't afford to part with it. 
Instead, she mentions that the kingdom had purchased many such balls, presumably for the other heroes. Upon studying the books, Neofumi discovers a gap in his capabilities. He understands the spoken language through his shield's auto-translate feature, but can't read it. Raftalia suggests they learn the language and magic together, especially since they have over a month before the next wave. Choosing to spend the night in Ryud, they find that their monster egg has hatched into a philoleal. The creature becomes an adult in just two days, thanks to Neofumi's newly unlocked Beast Tamer's shield. Named Philo for simplicity, the philoleal quickly becomes a new focal point for Neofumi's group. Just as they're settling into the new dynamic, Matoyasu arrives with a royal entourage and a decree declaring himself the new lord of the village. His first act, a crippling tax of 50 silvers to enter or exit, a fee that would effectively bankrupt the village overnight. Neofumi points out the absurdity of this tax, noting that a night at the inn, with food, costs a mere silver. His objection resonates with the villagers, sparking an uprising against Matoyasu's heavy-handed rule. Just as Malti readies her royal knights to quash the descent, a group of covert agents known as Shadows intervene, delivering a message that prompts a change in her decree. The new edict stipulates a dragon race between Neofumi and Matoyasu, with the village's governance at stake. Though reluctant to engage in this contest, Neofumi finds himself roped in when Philo eagerly challenges Matoyasu's dragon. The spear hero further sweetens the pot by promising a reward if Neofumi wins. During the pre-race preparations, Matoyasu's taunting of Neofumi and Philo reaches a boiling point, leading Philo to kick him squarely in the crotch. Sent flying by the force of the kick, Matoyasu provides the spectacle that finally cracks Neofumi's facade, eliciting from him a genuine smile, the first raft has seen since they met. The dragon race is straightforward, three laps around the village, starting and finishing at the gate. Right off the bat, Philo's impressive leg strength gives Neofumi a significant advantage over Matoyasu and his dragon. Yet, the race is far from fair. Malti's knights cast spells, setting up magical traps around the course, trying to sabotage Neofumi's win. Even with these setbacks, including debuff spells on Philo and speed boosts on Matoyasu's dragon, Philo maintains her lead. Neofumi navigates the traps with ease thanks to his shield's abilities, and they cross the finish line first. In a surprise twist, Philo morphs from an ostrich-like creature into something resembling a giant owl. Malti tries to spin this transformation as evidence of cheating, but the shadows intervene again. They reveal that the real cheaters were Matoyasu's team, citing the magic traps tailored to spell types Neofumi and Raftalia couldn't even use. Matoyasu's party slinks away, discredited. As for Neofumi's reward, he declines money, wary of more rumors accusing him of pillaging the village coffers. Instead, Philo chooses a slightly damaged wagon that survived the last wave. Neofumi is also given a merchant's pass, exempting him from tolls. The prospect of becoming a fighting merchant excites him. Leaving the village, they soon realize Philo's incredible speed has a downside. It leaves Raftalia Karsik. They make camp to allow her to recover. Neofumi discovers that Philo's feathers are incredibly warm and comfy. The next morning, however, he wakes up to find Philo replaced by a small blonde girl with angelic wings, who calls him master and asks for breakfast. Her heart is about to savor his sandwich when Neofumi, Raftalia, and a cloaked young blonde girl walk in. The girl mentions she's hungry, and Erhard offers a bite of his sandwich. To his astonishment, the girl morphs into a philoleal and gobbles down the whole thing in one. Neofumi and Raftalia explain their latest visit to Balaukas. Philoleal flocks often have a royal in disguise, capable of shape-shifting. Balaukas also fitted Philo with a high-grade slave crest, draining Neofumi's purse in the process. Making shape-shifting clothes for Philo is beyond Erhard's skill set, so he provides a dress left by another customer and directs them to a local tailor. The tailor needs magic threads, which in turn require a new magic crystal for the magic shop owner's spinning wheel. For now, the wheel remains crystal-less, but the magic shop owner does determine that Philo has an affinity for wind magic during a free consultation. Running out of immediate options, the group focuses on recouping losses. They fashion some merchandise and use Philo to pull their carriage between towns. During their journey, they encounter a frantic man dashing down the road. He's desperate to get medicine to his ailing mother. Striking a deal for payment, Neofumi leaves the carriage behind and rushes the man on Philo's back to his mother's house. There, Neofumi uses his medicinal skill to amplify the effects of the medicine, curing the woman. In gratitude, they're paid in food, and Neofumi and Philo head back to rejoin Raftalia. The group spends several days making money by selling goods, medicines, and offering rides, gradually gaining fame. 
Hikwal, an accessory merchant, notes that Neofumi is now known as a saint healer traveling with a carriage pulled by the god of domestic birds. During a discussion about this, Raftalia spots a gang of thugs on the road ahead. The leader states their intention to rob the merchant and have their way with Raftalia. Determined not to be victims, Neofumi, Raftalia, and Philo prepare to fight back. However, the thugs mention they have a class-upgraded bodyguard. Neofumi realizes he doesn't know the specifics of class upgrades and laments his lack of magic use. Raftali uses her magic to become invisible for a surprise attack, while Philo creates a tornado, defeating the bandits. The thugs reveal another merchant betrayed Hikwal, who is a friend of Neofumi's. Recognizing Neofumi as the shield hero, the bandits believe that the guards will favor them over the defamed shield hero. Neofumi simply feeds them to Philo, but after they beg for mercy, he quotes their earlier line, We'll spare your lives at least. The bandits lead them to their base, handing over all stolen items. Neofumi also extracts extra payment from the merchant for the trouble they caused. Impressed by Neofumi's business spirit, the merchant offers his connections and training as a craftsman. Neofumi learns to refine metals, craft and enchant gems, and even gains some magical knowledge. Neofumi also gets introduced to the merchant's network of contacts who share various rumors about the heroes. According to the grapevine, Matoyasu has miraculously ended famine in a village by planting a legendary crop. Ren has been on a monster-slaying spree in the southeast, even taking down a dragon, while Itsuki's heroic feats remain elusive. To top it off, the merchant provides Neofumi with a valuable letter of recommendation, granting him access to mine for ores and gemstones. With this letter in hand, Neofumi discovers the location of the magic gem required for Philo's transformative clothes. Accompanied by the magic shop owner, they journey to a cave adjacent to a deserted temple. Inside the cave, they find an empty treasure chest with a warning inscription in an ancient language, cautioning against opening it or taking its contents. Seeds. An ominous feeling settles over Neofumi. While exploring the cave, the group is perplexed by hearing each other's voices. Raftalia expresses her resentment at being labeled Neofumi's slave, and Philo voices disturbing desires. The magic shop owner intervenes, revealing that the cave's monsters mimic their thoughts and manipulate their voices to sow discord among them. Dispersing the illusions, Philo employs wind magic to vanquish these deceptive creatures. Further along their path, the group encounters a small new, roughly lion-sized. Raftalia and Philo launch an attack against it, realizing that the new is tracking Raftalia by sound. In a clever move, Neofumi employs his newly acquired voice Jenger shield, amplifying Philo's voice like a megaphone, stunning the new with a deafening sound assault. The creature is eventually defeated through a combination of fire magic, Raftalia's sword, and Philo's powerful kick. After successfully obtaining the crystals, the group returns to the magic shop. They use Philo's own mana to create the magic thread required for her clothes. Calculating the total cost, which includes the clothes and high-grade monster seal, Neofumi figures it to be 340 silvers, adding to the original 100 silvers spent on buying Philo. Neofumi emphasizes that Philo needs to work hard to earn and repay the accumulated debt. Acting on a tip from Hikwal, Neofumi and his team head to Lerno Village to sell a much-needed herbicide. Upon arrival, they discover the village plagued by aggressive fruit-bearing vines. The chief explains that Maroyasu's misguided attempt to solve a famine by planting a bio-plant seed has led to this chaos. These seeds are the same ones Neofumi encountered in the lair to the southwest. The bio-plant initially produced edible plants, but they mutated into monsters after Maroyasu's departure, even turning parasitic and infecting the villagers. A group of adventurers tried to uproot the plants but hasn't returned. Philo rescues these adventurers and, surprisingly, reveals her ability to talk, revealing Neofumi as the savior of the heavenly fowl. After healing the villagers, they ask Neofumi to finish what the adventurers started, eradicating the bio plant. After scolding the villagers for their lack of caution, Neofumi receives payment for his treatment and advances payment for the monster extermination and then heads into action, revealing his role as the shield hero. In their reckless attack on the bio plants, Raftalia and Philo stumble and put each other in comical situations, causing annoyance for Raftalia and a smirk from Philo. Recognizing the efficiency of using his shield-enhanced abilities to apply the herbicide, Neofumi takes on the plants with his superior defenses, directly pouring herbicide on the original bio plant's core, destroying it. To prevent a future disaster, Neofumi orders his companions to collect the seeds. Unlocking various shields through his legendary weapon, 
Neofumi gains the power to analyze and modify the plants. After a night of unsealing his new shield powers, Neofumi makes crucial changes to the plants, limiting their ability to mutate and controlling their growth and productivity rates. Neofumi plans to trade his modified seeds but the villagers, wary from their previous experience, exchange them for all their unmodified fruit to prevent further disaster and ensure profit. Neofumi finds the villagers a tough crowd for the seed trade and quickly sells the modified seeds to Hickwall, earning a good sum. Hickwall then offers another task, delivering a package to an inn with a nearby hot spring. After completing the delivery and making some money, Neofumi and his companions decide to spend the night. However, Raftalia's growing jealousy of Philo's closeness to Neofumi becomes apparent. Despite her efforts to bond with him and imagine their future together, she feels overshadowed by Philo's constant presence. Philo clings to Neofumi and even has him brush her hair, overhearing talk about a rare item named Ladian, which can be used to create an accessory that promotes love, Raftalia sees an opportunity. When night falls, Raftalia takes the initiative to acquire Ladium. She learns that a bird named Gagoku collects the ore, prompting her to find one of their nests. Coincidentally, Philo has the same idea, aiming to get a Gagoku egg to prove herself as a suitable mate for Neofumi. A race ensues, with Philo's stamina and leg strength giving her an initial advantage, but she falls off a cliff due to her playful behavior. In an attempt to save Philo, Raftalia falls as well, leading them to encounter a boar-like monster, the Silver Razorback. They escape the creature and bond during their adventure. While attempting to pilfer from the nest, the Silver Razorback appears and destroys the eggs, sending the ore flying. Outrage. The girls focus their anger on the boar and bring it back to town as a prisoner, eventually selling it to villagers. With the earnings, they buy tools to help Neofumi improve his crafting. After expressing gratitude, Neofumi suggests they clean up in the hot springs, and though they are treated like children, they agree to continue pursuing their connection with their master. As the group prepares to leave the next day, Neofumi overhears a merchant discussing the rapid sale of medicines in the nearby East Village. Deciding on their next business venture, they head in that direction. Late at night, Neofumi is crafting accessories, a bracelet for Raftalia and a hair clip for Philo. As morning comes and they prepare to hit the road, an elderly woman and young boy approach, warning of a deadly plague that struck their village and can't be cured by medicine. In the village, Neofumi follows his routine, treating the sick and injured and taking payment, though he's aware he's only treating symptoms. He village doctor explains that the origin of their troubles lies in the mountain's winds, carrying the poison from a dragon's corpse. This dragon was slain by Ren a month prior, and its body was left as a tourist attraction. However, the prosperity was short-lived, as the villagers soon fell victim to the poison carried by the mountain's wind. To worsen matters, the influence of the dragon's corpse has twisted the local monsters into vicious, poison-spewing creatures, making it impossible for regular adventurers to venture into the mountains. Despite the dire situation, the kingdom's knights and heroes claim they're too preoccupied to address the issue immediately, offering only promises of more medicine. Neofumi steps up, asking the guild to cancel the request while agreeing to tackle the problem himself for 5,000 silvers. This bold demand underscores that he won't be exploited as a naive savior. Boosting Philo with a buff, they charge through the mountain, facing monsters along the way. However, upon reaching the dragon's remains, an unexpected twist unfolds, the dragon's body reanimates, transforming into a fearsome zombie dragon. Reacting instinctively, Philo launches an attack against the reanimated creature, driven by the hate that exists between dragons and Philoleals. In a shocking turn, Philo is swallowed whole by the undead beast. Witnessing this, Neofumi's frustration boils over. He feels the world has repeatedly taken away what he holds dear. A glitched message appears, asking if he wants power and if he hates everything. Memories of Malti, King Altcray and the heroes flood Neofumi's thoughts as he spirals into a frenzied rage. Absorbing the dragon's attack, flames from the rage shield envelop Neofumi, his furious words urging for the creature's torment and demise. Raftalia's voice manages to pull him from his destructive trance. Yet, Raftalia's state is dire, poisoned by the dragon's onslaught and scorched by Neofumi's newfound shield. The looming threat of the dragon persists, and the only option is the dreaded cursed shield, capable of defeating the beast. Fearful of losing control again, Neofumi hesitates, afraid of the power he may unleash. Then, a miraculous twist, Philo emerges from the dragon's belly, having devoured a magic crystal that fueled its strength. The danger subsides, but Raftalia's condition remains critical. 
Despite her injuries, she's determined to clean up the aftermath of the battle before tending to herself. Neofumi obliges, taking care of the dragon's remains. The village payment is directed towards Raftalia's treatment. The doctor stresses the need for high-quality holy water to heal her, handing back most of the payment for Neofumi to procure it. Philo presents Neofumi with a piece of the dragon's crystal. Absorbing it into his shield, Neofumi unlocks a mysterious power he can't yet wield. The wrath shield stands apart from the upgrade tree, casting an ominous shadow over its potential. Expressing remorse for his fear and apologizing for their own weaknesses, Raftalia and Philo's genuine warmth elicits a rare smile from Neofumi. Determined to grow stronger, he sets a resolute vow. Days later, Neofumi, Raftalia, and Philo are locked in a battle against a horde of monsters, diligently carrying out their hired task of clearing the area. Throughout the fight, Neofumi and Philo repeatedly check on Raftalia, who is still grappling with the lingering effects of the zombie dragon's poison and the curse it unleashed. With the necessary funds amassed, Neofumi's priority is to procure the holy water needed to heal Raftalia. On their way back to the castle town, an unexpected encounter unfolds. An assembly of Philoleal surrounds a nobleman's daughter named Melty. The young girl's connection with Philo forms rapidly, despite the bird's initial misconceptions about her own species. Leaving Philo and Melty to interact, Neofumi tends to his responsibilities as a healer in the nearby village. Later that evening, while attending to Raftalia's injuries, Melty and Philo reappear, explaining that Melty has lost her way from her escort and requires assistance returning to the castle town. Struck by the girl's precarious situation and driven by the prospect of a reward, Neofumi agrees to undertake the task, unaware that their actions are being observed by an external spy. As the journey progresses, the group's camaraderie deepens through shared experiences, punctuated by breaks for sustenance and Raftalia's rest. During their camping moments, a peculiar discovery unfolds. Melty's clothes are found empty, raising alarm that she may have been consumed by Philo who had once referred to other philoleals as delicious. However, contrary to initial fears, Melty is found safe and sound, nestled without clothes within Philo's feathers. Raftalia succumbs to what Neofumi assumes to be the sleep-inducing effects of Philo's feathers. He decides to table the topic for the night. Upon their arrival in the castle town, Neofumi parts ways with Philo and Melty, making his way to the church to procure the holy water required for Raftalia's healing. At the church, Neofumi is met by the high priest who welcomes him with a touch of sarcasm, referencing the sacred duel with Madoyasu. Dismissing the pleasantries, Neofumi directly requests the most potent holy water available, priced at one gold coin. However, the church initially attempts to deceive him with an inferior substitute, only to be reprimanded by the high priest who sends a nun to retrieve the genuine article. The patronizing attitude of the high priest grates on Neofumi's nerves. Later, Neofumi is pursued by a town guard and decides to part ways with Raftalia temporarily, arranging to meet at Philo's carriage. Barely evading the guard, Neofumi suddenly finds himself confronted by Madoyasu, infuriated by the fact that Neofumi has acquired yet another slave girl, specifically Philo, whom he considers to be his type. Amusingly, Neofumi notices that Madoyasu is wearing a codpiece, possibly as protection from the kicks of that fat bird. Madoyasu's rage fuels a brawl in the heart of the market town, with his attacks missing Neofumi and causing chaos around them. The situation escalates into a riot. Attempts by the pursuing guard to defuse the conflict are undermined by Malti, who sanctions the fight as a duel and orders her knights to encircle the heroes. Malti intervenes, accompanied by her own guards, scolding her sister Malti for abusing her authority and reprimanding Madoyasu for his reckless behavior. With the situation eventually diffused, Raftalia arrives with Philo. Madoyasu's immediate advances towards Philo lead to an awkward revelation that Philo is Neofumi's big fat bird, resulting in a mixture of shock, horror, and pain as Philo transforms in anger and delivers a punishing kick to Madoyasu's groin, shattering his codpiece. Amid the aftermath, Neofumi recognizes the knight vice captain from the prior battle in Ryut village who displays respectful reverence towards the shield hero. Taking Melty to the weapon shop, she reveals that she is in line for the throne due to Melty's contentious character, which grants her the authority to override her sister's royal decrees. Melty genuinely did not know that Neofumi was the shield hero when they initially met. Despite her urgent matter to discuss, Neofumi remains unwilling to engage with the royal family. 
Driven by his deep mistrust of their motives, Neofumi straightforwardly tells Melty that he won't trust her due to her royal status, and he orders her to leave immediately. Coincidentally, Melty is urgently summoned by her father. As she returns to the castle, she recalls a task given to her by her mother, the queen, which involves going back to the capital to confront her father about his mistreatment of the shield hero. The queen is unable to do it herself at the moment. Meanwhile, Neofumi forbids Philo from interacting with Melty, causing Philo to run off in tears as Neofumi reflects on the actions of the king and Melty. A group of young knights and demi-human sorcerers enters the shop, expressing their desire to join Neofumi's party for the upcoming wave. They want to fight alongside Neofumi and not the other heroes, as they all come from Ryut village, the location of the previous wave. Neofumi recognizes the leader as the guard who previously chased him and another who fought with him during the last wave. They share Neofumi's reasoning that joining the heroes' parties would transport them to the wave location. Neofumi agrees to their request with a condition. They must pay 150 silvers for an accessory he crafted and the right to join his party. They promise to return after raising the money. Addressing the initial purpose of their visit, Neofumi upgrades his and Raftalia's armor with Erhard's assistance. During the process, Neofumi asks Erhard about the stars next to Philo's and Raftalia's names in his status screen. Erhard explains that the stars indicate they've reached a level cap and need a class upgrade at the Red Hourglass of the Dragon's Era to continue leveling. Neofumi discusses the idea of the class upgrade with his companions. While Raftalia is open to Neofumi's decision, he emphasizes that it's a significant choice that should consider her future after he returns to his world. Raftalia is shocked by his revelation. At the church, Neofumi is asked to pay an exorbitant 15 gold for each class upgrade. Noticing the nun's smug expression, Neofumi decides to play along and hands over the money for Raftalia's class up. However, another nun arrives and admits to a mistake, showing a royal decree that bans Neofumi and his party from receiving class upgrades. Furious, Neofumi storms away. He confronts Balaukas, who has profited from his business and gained fame for providing high-quality slaves to the shield hero. Neofumi demands to know how Balaukas managed to get class upgrades for his slaves. Balaukas explains that he can't offer class upgrades, but other countries like Zeltobel, Siltfelt, or Shieldfrieden might have the option. While Balaukas recommends Shieldfrieden, Neofumi realizes he won't reach it in time for the next wave. Balaukas suggests selling Wyvern Claws to enhance Philo's combat abilities. Unable to allow Philo to kill his monsters for testing, Balaukas informs them of monsters in Melramark's sewers that need to be dealt with. The group easily defeats the crocodile-like sewer monster in the capital town and rests for the night. As Raftalia is treated for the curse, she expresses her desire to accompany Neofumi to his world after the waves but their conversation is interrupted by Philo. Recognizing that Raftalia and Philo cannot level up, Neofumi decides to focus on wave preparation, including amassing medicines and scouting potential wave locations. While engaging in his merchant activities, Neofumi encounters a northern town where he's unexpectedly charged a toll fee despite his merchant pass. There, he encounters refugees from a neighboring country, who plead for food in exchange for their belongings. It turns out that Melramark had sent adventurers to aid the resistance against a tyrannical king in the neighboring country. But the situation has deteriorated further. As the impending wave approaches, Neofumi ensures the starving people are fed before returning to the castle town, with just over a day left. In a restaurant during mealtime, Neofumi's group overhears Ren and Itsuki discussing someone taking their quests and rewards. Itsuki receives a guild quest involving a northern lord exploiting his people through excessive taxes, using the funds to suppress dissent with mercenaries. Neofumi's drink merely becomes a spit take upon hearing this, catching Itsuki's attention. Itsuki assumes Neofumi is responsible for impersonating them, leading Neofumi to reprimand both Itsuki and Ren. The country Itsuki saved is now struggling due to increased taxes, while Ren's dragon-killing action inadvertently caused a plague. The blame for many deaths falls on Ren and Itsuki, particularly when Ren sees Raftalia's injuries and realizes their origin. Having said his piece, Neofumi departs, ordering the heroes to cease causing trouble. Itsuki remains skeptical, but Ren accepts Neofumi's criticism. Back at the weapon shop, Neofumi receives his upgraded armor with the zombie dragon core integrated and an auto-repair function. Ake's group catches up with Neofumi. 
Having gathered the needed funds to join his party, Mayafumi hands them the accessory and advises them to invest in better equipment, then holds a strategy meeting for the upcoming wave. Meanwhile, at a distant location, the queen confers with her shadows. A shadow reports Melty's contact with Mayafumi, but the prospect of reconciliation remains challenging. Recognizing the challenges she's imposing on Melty, the queen acknowledges the necessity for her daughter, as the future ruler of Melremark to confront these situations. She entrusts her shadow to monitor the events and expresses her hope that the heroes are prepared to confront the looming calamity wave. Meanwhile, the wave commences, guided by a woman in a dark kimono wielding a pair of hand fans. As the next wave approaches, Neofumi and his party make thorough preparations, amassing supplies like medicines and weapons. Erhard holds great faith in Neofumi's cautious approach and diligent efforts to ready themselves. Among their preparations, Neofumi crafts a mana-boosting bracelet bracelet for Raftalia, and a physical stat-boosting hair clip for Philo. Bake and his comrades join Neofumi's party, creating a group of eight that is transported to the location of the wave. Upon arrival, they come across goblins and beastmen attacking a lone villager. They save him and direct him to the safe location where other villagers have been evacuated. The local guards struggle against the onslaught until an elderly woman intervenes, swiftly dispatching the monsters. She briefly acknowledges Neofumi for his earlier assistance, revealing herself to be the same woman he had cured a month earlier. Despite the chaos, Neofumi questions the inactivity of the other heroes, three hours into the wave. With Ake's group, the other guards, and the old woman present in the village, Neofumi feels comfortable leaving them to protect it while he confronts the wave's boss. They spot a ghost ship soaring through the air, with Itsuki and his party targeting the ship's figurehead. Itsuki explains that this action will draw out the Soul Eater. However, the other heroes and their parties are aboard the ship searching for the boss. Upon reaching the ship, Neofumi witnesses Ren's group battling a skull captain that revives endlessly, while Matoyasu's group engages with the tentacles of a kraken. Disagreements over which enemy to prioritize lead to conflicts both against the monsters and amongst themselves. Neofumi sternly scolds the heroes for their immature behavior, and blocks shots from both monsters they were fighting. He emphasizes that treating the situation like a game could lead to their demise. Observing the Skull Captain, Neofumi notices something concealed in its shadow, and instructs Raftalia to use light magic against it. This forces the Soul Eater out of hiding, though lightning attacks from the heroes have little impact. Philo's swift wind-based kicks gradually wear down the enemy. However, time has been squandered, and the defenders are drained. Neofumi decides to summon Raftalia's emotional support, and unleashes the Rage Shield. Simultaneously, the voice of the zombie dragon urges for Ren's blood, transforming the Rage Shield into the Wrath Shield and altering Neofumi's armor into an eerie set. The Wrath Shield's flames envelop Philo, driving her into a berserk frenzy against the Soul Eater. Raftalia chides the heroes for pushing Neofumi to use the Wrath Shield and expresses her frustration at her own limitations. Itsuki and Ren become engaged, attacking monsters about to strike Neofumi, while Matoyasu reluctantly joins forces with Neofumi. Encouraged into action, they collaborate to defeat the Soul Eater alongside Philo. Raftalia works to pull Neofumi out of his enraged state before the flames consume him. Regaining his clarity, Neofumi combines Wrath Shield, Shield Prism, and Animal Needle Shield to unveil a new skill, Iron Maiden. Summoning the eponymous torture device, they trap the Soul Eater and deliver fatal blows from all sides. After the battle, both Philo and Neofumi collapse due to the effects of the Wrath Shield, leaving Philo with no memory of what transpired. Naturally, the other heroes suspect Neofumi of foul play but their problems escalate as a second Soul Eater emerges. Surprisingly, it's slain effortlessly by another individual. This newcomer is a young woman named Glass, who possesses long raven hair, dons a dark kimono, and wields steel fans. Glass ridicules the group's weakness against a monster and declares only Neofumi deserves the title of hero. She openly declares herself amidst the ongoing third wave. The cardinal heroes and their parties confront the mysterious woman in the black kimono, Glass. She introduces herself as their adversary, expressing her enmity towards Bow into One, a symbol Neofumi has seen before revealing that what may appear virtuous on the surface involves behind-the-scenes plotting. She advises Neofumi to exercise caution from this point onward, leaving Neofumi puzzled. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.